Lisa was sitting on the edge of the bathtub, clutching a pregnancy test in her trembling hand. This can't be happening, muttered the girl, looking at the two stripes. They were bright and literally teased and asked with a sneer, And what are you going to do now, Lisa? How are your Napoleonic plans for your life doing? Are they still on? Lisa had no answer to these questions. She didn't understand how this had happened. No, she knew that children do not come from cabbage, but she couldn't understand why she had fallen into this nature's trap. One single night, one mistake she had made, shouldn't have led to such a fatal outcome. The girl covered her eyes and remembered the night she had spent with the director, or, at least, back then she thought he was the director. That day she had passed the first round of the beauty pageant selection process. A small victory had turned Lisa Donovan's head. She always dreamed of fame, popularity and recognition. God had given her beauty, so she dreamed of a career as a model or actress, wanting to appear on the covers of popular glossy publications. Even in childhood, looking at her mother, who worked as a saleswoman, Lisa decided that she would not repeat such a fate. The girl was disheartened by the grey life that surrounded her, the poor condition of their apartment, cheap clothes, unpleasant neighbourhood. Lisa hated all of this. She loved the life from TV shows and magazines. She was fascinated by the glamorous world of fashion. At the age of five, she could already rummage through her mother's meagre makeup bag and walk down a makeshift runway with confidence. Who didn't walk in their mother's high heels as a child? Helena, Lisa's mother, used to say at such moments. Later, the girl started ballet and realised that she wanted to become a ballerina. After all, they were like fairies from fairy tales. Helena supported her daughter. The single mother didn't have much money, but she tried to support her daughter's hobbies, except that Lisa had problems in her classes. Your girl has a strong personality, the teacher Mrs. Wilson said to Helena. There is talent, undoubtedly, but it's not enough to justify her behaviour. The other girls are constantly complaining about her. Not a single lesson goes by without a scandal. She starts fights, purposely trips her classmates if they do something better. Lisa doesn't take criticism well and gets angry if she doesn't like something. Today, the girls were doing a simple dance step and Lisa couldn't do it, but she refused to listen to me and was rude. This is unacceptable. The last straw for the teacher was that Lisa pushed her daughter Michelle and called her names. Lisa and Michelle were the same age and attended the same dance class. Mrs. Wilson treated Michelle the same way as the other girls, sometimes even more strictly. However, Lisa believed that Michelle was being treated differently by the teacher. When Michelle was asked to demonstrate a glissade assemblé to the other students, she did it perfectly. For her age, she was incredibly talented, but Lisa was jealous of her success and felt she had to be first in everything. So she told Michelle that without her mother she was nothing, and then pushed her rudely, causing Michelle to twist her leg. That was the end of Lisa's ballet career. However, the girl continued to dream of popularity. She had no interest in her classmates, nor in her studies. Lisa only focused on her appearance, and fashion magazines became her Bible. At the age of 14, she started attending castings, but with no results. It turned out that appearance wasn't everything. To become an actor, talent was necessary. Lisa gritted her teeth and decided to take a different path. She began to try herself in the fashion industry, and so, when she turned 18, her suffering paid off. Passing the first round was the first step towards winning a beauty contest, and this encouraged Lisa. After being selected, she was invited to a party with the other girls. The party took place on a luxurious yacht. Lisa, who had never been on a yacht before, was impressed. She couldn't stop smiling, and although she had never drunk alcohol before, she didn't refuse the drinks offered to her. The taste of sparkling wine made her feel light-headed. It was at this party that she met Richard, a director who was looking for a girl to play the lead role in his new series. 
I work in France. I moved there to fulfill my dream of becoming a director, he explained to Lisa. Why France? the girl asked, surprised. Do you know that Paris is the birthplace of cinematography? The Lumiere brothers, who are considered the fathers of cinema, organized the world's first movie show at the Paris Grand Café. They invented the cinematograph and made the first short films like The Arrival of the Train, Richard said enthusiastically. But when it comes to the most beautiful girls, everyone knows they can only be found here. I have noticed you right away, Lisa. You may not have seen it, but I was sitting right behind the jury chairs. I think you're perfect for the lead role, and I can use my connections to put in a good word with the jury. You can count on winning. Richard reached out and gently touched Lisa's fingers, looking deeply into her eyes. Lisa's heart skipped a beat, and she didn't pull her hand away. It's finally a chance for me, she thought. After an hour and a couple of glasses of champagne, the director from France invited her to discuss her bright future in the movies in his cabin. Richard led Lisa to a luxurious suite, taking another bottle of champagne and a bucket of ice. As she looked at the bucket, Lisa was reminded of a scene from the James Bond movie Goldfinger. In that scene, Agent 007 seduces a girl by pulling out a bottle of Dom Perignon from an ice bucket. At that moment, Lisa realized she hadn't come to the VIP cabin to discuss her future in movies. She had come here for the glamorous life. May you close the door? Richard asked, opening the bottle. Lisa knew she had to make a choice, and it was clear to her. She nodded and closed the cabin door behind her, locking it with a golden key. Later that night, Lisa woke up to the sound of angry screams. She struggled to open her eyes and saw a handsome man in a tuxedo yelling at Richard. Richard stood there in his underwear with his head down like a shamed schoolboy. The shock brought Lisa to her senses and she quickly realized she was naked. Blushing, she covered herself with a blanket, trying to understand what was happening. The truth hit her like a bucket of cold water. In the world of show business, no one can be trusted. You're fired, the stranger shouted at Richard. How could you bring such a kind of woman into my quarters? I'm sorry, it won't happen again, Richard pleaded. Please don't fire me. I have a six-month-old baby. What am I going to tell my wife? You didn't think of that before? You wretch! How can you bear it? The man continued yelling. Lisa's lips trembled and tears filled her eyes. Not because it was her first time with a man. No, she was overwhelmed with resentment because Richard turned out not to be a director from beautiful France, but merely the chauffeur of the man who was really a European filmmaker and a member of the jury in a beauty pageant. Clean this place up, the director roared at Richard, who nodded like a puppet. Get this cheap one out of my bed quickly, and then tell the staff to change the bedding. It took Lisa a moment to realize that she was the one being referred to as this cheap one. She blushed deeply and tried to hide her face behind her hair, fearing recognition and disqualification. Fortunately for her, that didn't happen. However, she didn't win the contest in the end either. The girl was too tense, and this made her stumble during the fashion show and stutter during the interview. Of course, she didn't tell anyone about her fatal mistake. She wouldn't bear the ridicule and the jokes from her friends. Time had passed, and Lisa had managed to put that embarrassing mistake out of her mind. But news about pregnancy shook her to the core, as Lisa was sitting in the bathroom, lost in her thoughts, when a knock on the door and her mother's harsh voice snapped her back to reality. Lisa, are you going to stay in there for long? Helena asked impatiently. I came back from work an hour ago. I need to wash up too. Lisa quickly crumpled the test strip and pocketed it, then washed her hands and splashed cold water on her face to calm herself. She glanced at her reflection in the mirror before heading out to meet her mother. I'm tired, I just wanted to soak in the bath, Lisa said, without looking at her mother. I'm not hungry. 
I'm going to sleep right now. She hurried to her room, locking the door behind her. In front of a large mirror, Lisa examined her reflection intently, her focus on her belly. But no matter how she turned or looked, she still saw a thin girl, and the sight of her own thinness somehow reassured her. It must be a mistake, Lisa whispered to herself. Some kind of glitch. It wasn't until her doctor's appointment that her worst fears were confirmed. You're pregnant, the doctor remarked after a thorough examination. The pregnancy is not in its early stages, but I can confirm the exact term after an ultrasound. When was your last period? Lisa felt embarrassed. I don't remember, she admitted. I've been on a strict diet, trying not to gain weight, so my periods have been irregular. She brushed off the fact that she had forgotten about her menstrual cycle for the past six months. Lately, Lisa had noticed weight gain, and any change on the scale would anger her. Sometimes she would even stop eating and only drink water to stay slim. Her ideal was to be like Kate Moss at the beginning of her career. Lisa dreamt of achieving that look, so she tried every diet she could find. And when was your last experience with a man? The doctor asked, now with a more serious expression. Lisa bit her lip and exhaled. It was more than six months ago. The doctor's hand, recording the patient's information in a book, froze. She looked up at Lisa. Have you noticed any other signs of pregnancy? Morning sickness? Breast enlargement or tenderness? Fatigue? Heartburn? These are common symptoms of a pregnancy. Lisa ran her hands through her hair in frustration. She shook her head, not because she denied the doctor's words, but because it was all part of her life, even without pregnancy. Lisa, who aspired to be a model, often faced gastrointestinal problems. Morning sickness and heartburn were nothing new or alarming to her. Yes, I... I have issues with eating. I've thought that... Oh, my God. What am I going to do now? Lisa straightened abruptly, looking into the doctor's eyes. I can't have a baby. I don't want to be a mother. Can we get rid of it? Can we do it now? I'm afraid the deadline has long passed, she said. If what you say is true, your baby is already a human being, you know. The ultrasound confirmed the doctor's words. Lisa learned that there was a baby growing under her heart, a healthy baby girl. The doctor ran further tests and hurried to examine the expectant mother. Everything is okay. You'll meet your baby soon, the doctor assured her with a kind smile. Except Lisa didn't even smile back. The pregnant girl looked at her picture that the doctor had handed her, but she still couldn't understand how it could be inside her. At home, Lisa sobbed as she confessed everything to her mother. The doctors won't let me have an abortion, she cried. I'll find another clinic, one that will agree. Quiet, the neighbours will come running, her mother said, pale and crossing herself. What am I saying? That's impossible already. Dear, don't worry. A child is not a bad thing. So what if there's no father? There are the two of us. We'll figure it out. I raised you. I'll take care of another child. Actresses don't have babies, neither do models, she shouted at her mother hysterically. I don't want a child. I want to be famous. When the emotions subsided, Lisa could finally come to terms with the fact that she was going to be a mother. That's the right thing to do, Helena told her. You'll still be happy when you see your baby girl. Maternal love is the strongest, selfless love. However, her words were not prophetic. The girl, whom Lisa named Elle, was born two months later. Lisa did not feel any connection with her daughter, and as before, she was only interested in her own life and career. The child even irritated her. When Elle was three months old, Lisa managed to get a role in a play. This only increased her resentment towards the little girl. The child often cried and had trouble sleeping, which prevented Lisa from getting rest at night. Mum, do something with her, 
she shouted angrily as the girl began to cry. I'm trying to learn my lines. She's disturbing me. She has a tummy ache, probably because you started feeding her formula instead of breast milk. Helena shook her head as she rocked the little girl in her arms. You should have held her and shown her love. Maybe if she smells her mother's scent, she'll calm down. She misses you. Lisa simply snorted grudgingly. What does she know? She's only a couple of months old. You said you would help, so sit with her. The play went well. Even though Lisa didn't have the lead role, she had an affair with a theatre director. This time the man was a real director, so the girl hoped for a starring role in his next production. Soon, Lisa went on tour with the troupe, leaving her six-month-old daughter with her mother. Her career, as she had dreamed, was on the rise. However, she didn't tell anyone about her daughter waiting for her at home. She considered Elle her dirty secret. Lisa's schedule was demanding. She spent most of her time in the theatre. Six days a week, the young artist had rehearsals, followed by performances. She was not at home from morning until midnight, and sometimes she did not return for several days. Later, she would tell her mother with a blissful smile, After the premiere, we went to a party. It was such an unusual theatre party. Igor introduced me to some powerful people. Igor, is that your boyfriend? He's the director, right? Helena asked, glancing at her daughter. When are you going to introduce him to Elle? Lisa furrowed her brow and quickly glanced at her little daughter. It was obvious that looking at the little girl displeased her. The child seemed alien to her, and Elle stopped reacting to her mother. Previously, she would smile, reaching for her mother's hands. But now, a spoon given to her by her grandmother interested her more than her real mother. It's not the right time, Lisa replied finally. You know that men don't like women with kids. It's not critical for decent men, Helena said to her granddaughter. Lisa blinked, but then she decided she didn't want to talk about the unpleasant topic any more. She paced the kitchen, talking about the applause from the audience she had managed to capture, the praise from the director, and the envious glances from other artists. They even wrote about me in the newspaper. I'm sure I'll get into the movie. You'll see me on TV soon, Mum. That would be nice. At least somewhere your daughter will be able to see her mother often, even if it's only in a movie. Helena couldn't help but be sarcastic as she fed Elle porridge. And so their life went on. Elle grew up, and Helena tried to replace her mother. But the years were not the same, and it became increasingly difficult for the woman to keep up with the restless girl. As Elle grew older, Lisa began to treat her with more warmth. She liked that her daughter was gorgeous and resembled her. However, she still didn't want to give Elle much of her time. Lisa would return home after tours, concerts or social gatherings, happy and radiant. In those moments, she wasn't angry at her daughter and would share a little bit of warmth. Elle cherished these moments, absorbing them like a sponge. If she could, she would take her mother's affection and hide it in her pockets, saving it for later like delicious candy. One day, when Lisa returned to her childhood home after a long time, she found her little girl wearing a white gymnastics leotard and a tutu skirt. Lisa was astonished to see her old costume on the child, which had yellowed in some places. Mummy, look what I can do now! exclaimed the girl. Elle quickly sat in the splits and then stood on tiptoe, extending her leg. She was in a rush to show her mother everything she had learned. Elle longed to hear praise from the person who meant the most to her. She always looked at your old photo albums. When she saw your child pictures, she said you looked like an angel, and asked to go to ballet school herself. Helena reluctantly shared. Your old school is still open, and it's not far away. And why did you let her go? Remember how it ended for me? And by the way, you're just wasting your money. Ballet is expensive. 
I spend money from my pension, and Ellie's doing great. Michelle praises her, and she charges me half of the fee. She said that the rest will compensate for Elle's talent, replied Helena. Michelle, whispered Lisa in disdain, is that the daughter of my teacher, Mrs. Wilson? Yes, her mother nodded. She inherited her mother's school, and now she teaches the girls. However, Helena said nothing about the fact that the trauma Lisa had done to Michelle as a child had been extremely unfortunate. Michelle continued to study with her mother, but the path to a big stage was closed for her. So now she dedicated herself to teaching others. After all, her entire childhood and adolescence were spent in ballet halls. No, it's still expensive. And tutus and point shoes. Lisa was indignant. Do you know that ballerinas can spend up to 300 shoes a year? No, I'm against it. She won't become a ballerina, and it's too much money to spend just for a temporary hobby. If you have nowhere to spend the money, then give it to me. I just need a new dress. I mend her socks and other clothes every week, but I can't even close the closet because of your outfits. The mother was angry at her neglectful daughter. I want to be a star. I cannot appear in the same thing in public. Lisa splashed her hands. You know what? I don't want to argue. Let me tell you how I had my premiere. Lisa sat down on the sofa, throwing her leg over her foot and spreading her silk skirt. It was blue and flowed like water. Elle was sitting on the floor at this time, looking at her mother. She could not understand why her teacher constantly praised her and called her a talented pearl, and her mother said nothing although Elle tried very hard. Elle loved going to ballet school. After kindergarten on class days, she would grab her grandmother's hand and hurry, running to class with her, so as not to be late and be the first to arrive, because for Elle, being the first and starting the circle was important. The girl thought that her mother, who always talked only about the stage and applause, would pay attention to her if she became a ballerina. However, Lisa continued to think only of herself. Time passed, but nothing changed. Elle, being a naive child, saw Lisa as a beautiful princess from the fairy tales Grandma read. She admired her mother because she was so beautiful, smelled of perfume, came with flowers, and always brought her presents, and also promises. Many, many promises. When you grow up, I will definitely take you on tour with me. I'll show you how my life goes behind the scenes and on stage, Lisa cooed, hugging her daughter. Maybe you'll want to become a model, or an actress like me. You're so beautiful, Elle. You know, you're turning six this year. I'll come to the party. We'll spend your birthday together. Really? Elle clapped her hands and then hugged her mum tightly around the neck. May I invite my girlfriends? No one at daycare believes I have a mum. I say you're pretty and play different princesses on the stage, but they call me a liar. They say I only have a granny. Of course invite me, Lisa smiled broadly. I'll throw such a party that you'll be the envy of everyone. We'll buy a huge pink cake and new matching dresses. May we have a yellow cake? Elle asked. I don't like the colour pink. Even a rainbow cake. You can choose any colour, promised her mother. Helena only snorted. Your daughter has unfulfilled promises like a sweet tooth has candy wrappers. She said with anger. Lisa, Elle believes you. You missed all her previous birthdays. I mean, she waits for you every time. And then she gets a present in the mail and tries to hold back the tears. The last time... She didn't go to bed all night, didn't blow out the candles on the cake, didn't let me unbraid her hair or take off her dress. She was expecting you to come to her party. You didn't even call. Do you even know what your child's wish is? She doesn't want another doll or a stuffed elephant. She wants to spend the day with her mum. It'll be different this time. 
Lisa pressed her lips together resentfully. I'll be there. It is not known how long all this would have gone on, had it not been for an accident that was to change Lisa's life completely. It was Elle's sixth birthday. She woke up in the early morning. The girl, feeling a pleasant excitement and anticipating the holiday, jumped from the bed and hurried to her grandmother's room. Grandma! Grandma! chirped the birthday girl. Wake up! Wake up! Mummy is coming today! Will there be balloons? When's Mummy coming? She promised me a yellow cake. Will there be two floors, like in the cartoon? But Grandma did not react to her grandmother's words, no matter how much she tried to stir her up. Elle didn't know that Grandmother had fallen asleep forever. During the night, Helena had had a cardiac arrest. Little Elle cried, begged her grandmother to wake up, swore that she was making such a bad joke. But all in vain. Hour after hour passed, but her granny did not get up. For Elle, the time seemed like an eternity. She took her grandmother's push-button phone, but it was disconnected. The girl tried to go out, but she couldn't find the key. Elle was completely confused, her heart fluttering in her chest. She did not realize the tragedy of the situation, but she knew that something must be done. Mummy will come soon, the girl remembered, and having calmed down a little, even became cheerful. Mummy will come, and Grandma will get up too. We just have to wait for Mummy. At the same time, Lisa was many kilometers away from her hometown. The woman was in the dressing room, with the sound of applause still ringing in her ears after the just past performance. She played her best and favorite role of Roxanne in the play Serrano de Bergerac. She had a blissful smile on her lips. Lisa looked at her reflection in the mirror, illuminated by light bulbs. There was a knock at the door. Come in. She threw us a note of haughtiness. Who's there? Lisa. She heard a pleasant voice behind her. My name is Pierre Trelliard. We haven't met, but I'd like to fix that. I've seen you on stage. I'm ready to write my name in the ranks of fans of your talent. Lisa looked over her shoulder and froze. Not from the fact that the man was handsome or holding a luxurious bouquet of roses. No, it was just that she recognized him. The stranger who had been the only witness to her shame. The owner from the yacht. Yet, from the Frenchman's face, he didn't recognize her. Of course, for now, she was no longer a thin and disheveled bird, but a plump bird with a shining plumage. Lisa had involuntarily been following his life. She knew he made great movies, and appearing in one meant a golden ticket into the world of show business and popularity. He was known for not conducting standard casting for the main characters in his movies. As a temperamental and eccentric director, he personally discovered talents and stars for his films. And now he's found Lisa. Quickly remembering her own artistic identity, Lisa composed herself. She straightened her shoulders, smiled dazzlingly, and slightly lowered her eyelashes, as if displaying a sense of humility. Oh, I know you. You're the director, right? She rose from her seat and gracefully approached the guest. I admire your movies. It's an honor for me to receive kind words from the maestro of the film world. She accepted the flowers and inhaled their fragrance. A blush appeared on her cheeks. Thank you. These are my favorite flowers. She lied, stealing a glance at Pierre from beneath her lashes. I won't delay the purpose of my visit. I have a proposition for you. I think you'll like it. The director smiled. Are you sure? She flirtatiously smiled at the man. What is it? A hand and heart proposal, perhaps? Then I'll need a few minutes to consider. I'm a lady. The man laughed, appreciating both the flirtation and the joke. I want you to change the stage to a movie set. 
I believe you deserve more than that, Lisa, he said. Would you like to discuss the details privately? If you're available, of course. Lisa's breath caught. She had planned to meet Igor after the performance, but now she realised clearly that the theatre director no longer interested her. She had already squeezed everything from him, and now she was open for the next journey. With great pleasure, she said and smiled, promising. Pierre offered her a chance to go to Europe and star in his project. Lisa's head spun with the prospects that lay before her, and she completely forgot about her child waiting for her somewhere far away. After spending two days in Pierre's apartment and in his bed, Lisa received a call from an unknown number. She frowned and said, Hello? into the receiver. Is this Lisa Donovan? the unfamiliar woman said. Yes, who is this? Lisa asked, holding the phone with her shoulder and grabbing her scarlet lipstick to touch up her lips. Please, speak quickly, I'm busy. She had plans to have dinner with her new lover. You have a call from the regional hospital, the stranger began, about your mother and daughter. What's wrong with them? Is someone sick? Lisa asked indifferently, smoothing her lipstick. Please sit down, if possible, the woman requested. Just speak already. Lisa couldn't bear the suspense any longer. The woman on the other end of the phone hesitated. Lisa glanced at her watch, growing increasingly impatient and annoyed. Finally, the stranger spoke. Your mother passed away two days ago. She had a heart attack. My condolences, she said. Your daughter was in the apartment with her grandmother the whole time and couldn't leave. Eventually, she tried to call for help through the window. There was a mosquito net in place. The child leaned on it. The net broke and the girl fell. What? What happened to her? Lisa sat down on the edge of the bed, her legs giving way. The lipstick slipped from her weakened fingers, hitting the stick against the white carpet, leaving a stain resembling a smear of blood. She's alive and her condition is now stable. It's actually a miracle. The child fell from the third floor onto a bush, which broke her fall. However, the girl has some health issues. You'll need to come over. Lisa informed Pierre only about her mother's passing. She hadn't accepted his offer to go with her because she still kept the child hidden from her new suitor. When Lisa returned to her hometown, the grim and grey, unsightly reality she had been running from for so long enveloped her like a dense woolen blanket eaten away by moths. It stifled her breath and filled her lungs with dust. The mother's funeral bad health conditions of the daughter. All this knocked the ground out from under the feet of the actress, who only yesterday met a new love affair, reveled in male attention and passion, and dreamed of a trip to Europe. Lisa arrived at the hospital after her mother's funeral. She was hesitant to see her daughter, as if she already knew what to expect. The doctors delivered devastating news. Elle had suffered a severe spinal injury the extent of which made it impossible to provide a prognosis. Elle's doctor took Lisa into his office and shared the grim reality. Elle has a 50-50 chance. Her recovery will be a long and arduous journey. It will be difficult and painful, especially considering her young age. She may regain the ability to walk. However, it will require a miracle. Exhaustive work and constant care for the child. These words felt like a death sentence to Lisa. As she approached her daughter's ward, her anxiety intensified. She hesitated to enter and face her daughter's condition. Lisa stood at the door, trying to compose herself, and clutched a toy giraffe she had brought for Elle. Suddenly she overheard a conversation among the nurses inside the room. "'Oh, it's such a pity about the girl. They say she used to attend ballet school.' one nurse remarked. She's so beautiful, like a doll, but now she'll be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of her life. She won't even be able to go to the restroom on her own. Poor thing. She rarely sleeps and waits for her mum. The other nurse expressed her concern and sadness, asking, Is it really that bad? 
Don't doctors say that miracles can happen? But the first nurse responded with a touch of cynicism. Have you personally witnessed any miracles? Let me tell you, I've seen numerous people with similar injuries in my life. It will be miraculous if she can even hold a spoon on her own. She's already considered disabled. Lisa turned pale and trembled like a fragile leaf in the wind. She vividly imagined her future with Elle, realising she had no one else to rely on. She envisioned herself giving up her glamorous attire for drab home clothes, just like her mother had worn. She would have to cook and feed Elle, who would now require assistance even for the simplest tasks. The thought disgusted and saddened her. Lisa wanted to escape from this harsh reality, but she did not notice that the conversation had ended and one of the nurses came out of the corner and literally bumped into Lisa. Ouch! gasped the woman in surprise, but her expression quickly brightened. Hello, you must be Lisa, Elle's mother. We have been eagerly awaiting your arrival. Elle will be thrilled to see you when she wakes up. She's been asking all the time if her mummy is coming. She's currently asleep, but you can wait in the ward. Lisa nodded, feeling confused. Her legs felt heavy, as if made of lead. She entered the ward and froze, gazing at her daughter. The pale girl lay in the bed, appearing peaceful. Lisa even thought she would suddenly jump up and run to her, moving with a spring-like bounce in her step. However, as she observed everything more closely, she noticed the catheters and a wheelchair prepared for the future. Why has this happened to me? The woman whispered in horror. Finally facing the harsh reality, she collapsed into a chair, letting the giraffe fall to the floor. Lisa covered her face with her hands, suppressing her tears. She realised that she felt no pity for her daughter. Instead, she felt pity for herself and her future that this child seemed determined to ruin from the very beginning. You sneaked into my life, Lisa recalled, wiping away the mascara-streaked tears from her face. You destroy everything in your path. Lisa had dreams of achieving greatness and yearned for glory. She was young and beautiful, but what awaited her now? Elle was like a burden, a weight dragging her down. No, she couldn't allow that. I'll give birth to a new child and forget about Elle, Lisa thought. Yes, that's right. I'll have a healthy boy or girl by Pierre, and then he'll be mine forever. Suddenly, the silence in the hospital ward was shattered by the ringing of a telephone. The loud and upbeat pop song, as the ringtone, seemed improper in this sterile environment. Lisa grumbled and reached into her bag to silence the phone. She glanced quickly at Elle's face, afraid that any noise would wake her. The girl frowned, her pale lips trembling, but she remained in the realm of dreams. Hi, Pierre, the woman whispered, taking the call. She stood up and stepped back to the window, staring out at the courtyard where the patients were walking. Lisa, are you all right? When will you be free, my lovely star? The man cooed. He had called Lisa his lovely star, which would soon light up in the sky. He believed in it, and he believed in Lisa. He whispered it to her for the first time, crumpling the silk sheets and capturing her moans with his lips. The nickname, spoken in the language of love, and memories of his arms, made Lisa's heart squeeze slightly. She closed her eyes, allowing these emotions to wash over her. The woman realised it was too early to speak of true feelings, but she had never experienced such emotions with Igor or anyone else. Pierre stirred her blood, made her heart beat furiously. She was falling in love with him. It's okay, I just still can't get over it. You know, it's a tragedy. I've never had anyone but my mum, Lisa muttered. Lisa, I understand everything, but you have to pull yourself together. It hurts to lose loved ones, but you can't bring your mum back. The stage cannot wait. You must seize the opportunity when it presents itself. Rubbing her tense forehead, she shook her head. I understand, but... Lisa cast a glance over her shoulder at her sleeping daughter. No buts, Lisa. 
I called to say I'm leaving for France today. We're starting filming, and I'm waiting for my star, said Pierre. It's up to you to get on this train, but know that the next one may never come. You're calling me to France? the woman gasped. Exactly. I'm waiting for my lead actress, said Pierre. Lisa stood frozen in place. She had dreamed of being in the capital of France, even before that fateful night on the yacht. She longed to be in the city, on the banks of the Seine, a city considered the fashion capital of the world, and the birthplace of cinema. I... I'll come, Lisa exhaled, and then whispered passionately. I beg you, give me a little more time to sort out some formalities, and then I will come, and belong only to you and the stage. The answers and promises of the future actress satisfied the Frenchman. A week, no more, Pierre said and ended the call. Lisa was looking pensively out the window, and suddenly a timid voice sounded. Mummy? Lisa flinched, the phone almost slipping out of her hands. She looked up at her daughter with a startled expression. Tears welled up in the little girl's bright green eyes. Mummy, is it really you? Have you come? she cried. Elle was looking at Lisa, afraid to blink in case the vision disappeared. Seeing her daughter's helplessness, Lisa felt weak, but she managed to force a smile. Yes, honey, I'm here. How are you? I'm fine, mummy, the girl replied quickly, looking at her mum with anticipation. However, she didn't understand why she was frozen and looking so strange, why she wasn't hugging her. Are you mad, mummy? the little girl finally realised. I won't do it again. I have been waiting for you to come to my birthday party. I have been waiting for a long, long time, but Grandma never woke up. She always asked me not to go to the window, and I haven't listened for that day. But I won't do it again. I'll be a good girl. Lisa's throat felt like a vice. She clenched her teeth, afraid that a sob would escape. At this moment... As she looked into the little girl's trusting face, Lisa couldn't quite grasp her own feelings. She just turned six. I missed her birthday again. If only I had been there, Lisa thought, but quickly pushed away the painful thoughts. No, Lisa resolved within herself. I will start anew. It's for the best. That she's without me too. I can't live with a disabled child. I could become famous, but not burdened with her. Having a handicapped child is a mark of shame, a disgrace. Pierre would stop loving me if he knew about Elle. Mummy, I love you so much, Elle suddenly exclaimed. Lisa looked into her daughter's eyes and responded dryly. I love you too, Elle. You'll get better, I'm sure of it. Rest now, I'll call the nurse. I need to talk to your doctor. Saying this, Lisa stood up and hurried out of the ward. An hour later, the whole hospital staff was in shock. Someone had overheard Lisa speaking to the doctor, expressing her intention to give up Elle and leave her in the hospital under the state's care. It took a long time to resolve matters with the doctor and receive guidance on how to transfer the child to a nursery home for the children with disabilities. When Lisa left the doctor, it was dusk outside. She quietly made her way towards her daughter's ward. But upon reaching the door, Lisa changed her mind about entering. Instead, she decided to leave without saying goodbye. She was about to go away when suddenly the door opened. Mum! the girl called out to the ward. Mummy, are you leaving? Lisa abruptly turned around, her gaze fixed on her daughter. That realistic nurse who had been talking about the impossibility of a miracle for Elle this afternoon, was standing near the door. When Lisa saw her face, she realised that she opened the door intentionally. "'Hey, you must have forgotten to say goodbye,' she said in an arrogant and almost menacing tone, splashing her hands. "'A child is not a dress you can discard if a button comes off. Do you know how she has been waiting for you? She needs support.' and care now more than ever. But instead of stirring her conscience, these words had the opposite effect on Lisa. 
Her face turned a deep shade of purple as she trembled with anger. It's none of your business. If you enjoy cleaning up after sick people and wiping drool, that's your choice. This is not the life I chose. She shouted with a piercing voice that reverberated down the hallway. The nurse recoiled from the enraged mother. Tears streamed down Elle's cheeks once again. Mummy, why are you leaving? Are you really leaving forever? She whispered, searching Lisa's face for answers. Lisa turned away, nodding. However, she did it so non-obviously and weakly that it was hard to see the affirmative nod, but Elle noticed it. A tiny heart was beating in a child's chest, but it held more love than there was water in the ocean and the stars in the sky. At that moment, Elle finally realised that her feelings were unrequited. She had suspected it before, but she hadn't allowed herself to believe it. The truth was deafening and painful. It made her dizzy and her chest ache, and she desperately wanted to cry. This is all happening because I have been a bad girl, she thought, feeling sudden fright. Mummy, I'm sorry. Mummy, please don't go away. I'll be good. Just forgive me. Lisa's lips trembled. She gripped the handle of her bag tighter, shook her head, and took a step toward the exit. No, Mummy, cried the girl, summoning the last of her strength and choking on her tears, tried to move, just to be close to her mother. Mummy, don't leave me, cried the child with her last strength. Oh, my God, my darling, my darling, wailed the nurse, leaping to the girl. Tears were streaming down the cheeks of the woman, who could not be surprised by anything. Lisa was horrified by the unfolding scene. She took hurried steps back, one after another. Then she turned and ran away, and the clatter of her heels was heard in the ward for a long time. Mummy! Mummy! whispered the exhausted and destroyed Elle. I'll be cured! I'll be healthy, I promise! Mummy! Please don't leave me again! Mummy! This cry will haunt Lisa for a long time. She'll wake up in the best hotels, on luxurious sheets and in ordinary actors' trailers, as well as in the arms of her favourite Pierre, but always in a cold sweat, shivering with tears on her cheeks. She'll be dreaming of that scene of her daughter helplessly lying on the hospital bed and begging not to leave her. And she'll always be afraid that some day her terrible secret will be revealed to the world, and then her gorgeous life will turn to ashes, and those around her will turn their backs on her. Many years will pass, and Lisa's biggest nightmare will come true. Fate will present the woman with a bill for a large sum, because everything has to be paid. Michelle Wilson walked down the hospital corridor, feeling strange. On her feet were soft shoes, something resembling the usual point shoes, only without the hard toe box. The woman didn't like hospitals. She remembered when her mother, who had been a role model, had fallen ill abruptly. From a stately lady, important and proud, she had quickly turned into a dry and ill woman. Michelle had spent a lot of time at her hospital bedside. Proud Mrs. Wilson did not want to meet her end, in her bed at home. She did not want to burden her loved ones, showing them her weakness and demanding care. However, Michelle visited her at the hospice every day until the very last day. Perhaps that was why now she had a feeling of anxiety, sadness and a kind of hopelessness in her soul. Even worse was the fact that she had come to visit not some elderly woman, but a little girl, her brilliant student. She was only six years old, but Elle seemed older than her years. The girl was attentive, focused and determined. Michelle remembered how she begged her grandmother to wait for her a little longer, trying to perfect simple movements. Michelle thought that Elle was not at all like her mother. Yes, she remembered Lisa. Many years had passed, but it was difficult to forget the person who had ruined your life out of anger. 
At first, Michelle didn't even want to take Elle into her school, thinking that personal animosity would hinder her from teaching the girl well. But Elle won her over. A little girl with hair as dark as tar, pale skin, and emerald eyes sneaked into the heart of her teacher. Michelle knew that most of her students were the children of rich parents. They didn't care about their daughter's talent or success. They just wanted to take pictures of their little girls in beautiful swan costumes during the recital and show off in front of their rich friends. But Elle, she was unique. The girl seemed to understand the whole essence of ballet dancing. It wasn't just technique. The best parts should be performed with song, and Elle knew this. When Michelle found out what had happened to her, she was in such shock that she cancelled her classes. Her hands were numb, and all she could think about was Elle. Elle was never late for class, and when she didn't show up at all, Michelle started to worry. She even called Helena, but no one answered the phone. The news reached her a week later and shocked her. Now, the teacher gathering her strength came to visit Elle at the hospital. She hoped to cheer her up. In her hands were flowers and a bag with a gift. She had bought her best student a new ballet outfit and pink satin point shoes. Michelle understood that she couldn't give them to a girl who was in a wheelchair, but for some reason she took the gift with her anyway. As she approached the room, a young nurse came out. Oh, are you here to see Elle? she asked. You know, I should warn you, she stopped talking altogether. After the accident? the teacher asked sadly. No, the nurse shook her head dejectedly. She stopped answering questions after her mother's visit. Michelle frowned. What's happened? she asked with sudden anger, even surprising herself, as if she already knew the answer. The nurse looked around fearfully, afraid that someone might overhear. However, the girl was not opposed to gossip, so she spoke up. She refused to keep Elle. She said she didn't want a disabled child and didn't want anything to do with her. She asked us to take her to an orphanage. She didn't even want to know where her daughter would be sent. Carla drained from Michelle's face. For a moment, she even struggled to breathe, as if she had stumbled and fallen after an unfortunate pirouette. The nurse continued to speak, but Michelle was no longer listening. I'll go see Elle, she interrupted the girl hoarsely. You brought flowers for the child? The young nurse was surprised to see the luxurious bouquet. She's not just a child. Elle is my student. It's customary to bring flowers to ballet dancers, Michelle replied. I'm afraid the path to the stage is closed for her. The nurse shook her head and stepped aside, allowing the teacher to pass. The room was quiet, but Elle was awake. She was lying on the bed, her head turned towards the window. Her gaze was devoid of emotion. A plush giraffe lay beside her. Hello, my little Pearl, Michelle smiled softly. The girl perked up and turned towards her. Her face twitched as if she wanted to respond, but changed her mind. I'm sorry it took me so long to come, she said as she took the bouquet and put it in a vase. Do you like the flowers? I chose all the yellow ones they had at the florist. That's your favourite colour, isn't it? I think it turned out lovely. Elle looked at the flowers in silence, a bright spot of sunshine in her dreary room. She had once confided in her teacher that she dreamt of receiving a bouquet after a performance. Michelle looked at the child, feeling her heart break once again. It was as if all the strength and emotion had been drained out of Elle. She sat down next to her and began sharing funny incidents from her school and ballet life. Can you imagine? Recently Holly declared she would never dance in the Nutcracker because there's a mouse king there. She's afraid of mice. Are you afraid of mice? Michelle tried to joke, hoping to see Elle's lips twitch again. Soon the child gave the teacher a smile that made Michelle relax a little. She gently touched the girl's dark hair. There you are, smiling. You look so beautiful in these moments, she said, 
gently stroking Al's head, and then asked, Do you know why I called you Pearl? The girl shook her head, looking curiously at the teacher. You know, in ballet, there are certain steps called pas de boire. My mum used to call them pearl beads. She used to say that real ballerinas do that move like stringing pearls on a thread. The first time you did them, it was incredible, as if you had always done them that way. I was amazed, and I couldn't help but think of you as a pearl. Michelle shared her innermost thoughts. Elle listened with her mouth agape, mesmerized by such high praise. Michelle leaned closer to the girl and looked into her eyes. Now, I'm sure I wasn't wrong. Do you know that pearls are the queens of all gems? The chance to find a pearl in the sea is great luck. I think you are the real pearl. You've got talent, honey, so no matter what happens, you must not give up. Do you understand me? The girl nodded, but then her lips quivered, and then she said quietly, softly, I can't dance any more. Michelle never made promises unless she was certain she could fulfill them. However, this time, the words burst from her lips before she had a chance to consider them. You will. The important thing is to believe. I'll stay with you, my pearl. I will help you. Michelle took a box of birthday presents out of the bag and showed its contents to the little girl. You will wear these point shoes, my girl. I swear, I will do everything I can for it. Tears appeared in Elle's eyes, which today were as dark as forest moss. Michelle hugged her tightly around the shoulders, making sure the girl wouldn't see that she herself was crying. At that moment, Elle wished she could hug her teacher too. Instead, she covered her eyes, resting her face against Michelle's neck. Her salty tears poured down on the silk handkerchief, one of the ones the teacher always wore around her neck. The little girl was afraid to trust an adult again. However, she longed to be loved by someone. At that moment, when Michelle embraced Elle, their new life began. Michelle never had a personal life. She only had brief affairs with men who admired her beauty and grace, but couldn't capture the heart of the ballerina and stay by her side for long. First, Michelle had her studies. Then her mother fell ill. Their family business, a ballet school, fell onto Michelle's fragile shoulders. The young woman had to prove to students and parents that she was just as good as her mother. Therefore, thoughts of having a family and a child rarely crossed her mind. Yet sometimes she yearned to give up everything and become a mother, especially when she saw happy women who brought their little girls to her school and kissed them goodbye. However, Michelle firmly believed that a career and children were incompatible. She remembered her mother's words, said with great seriousness, when she allowed her to go to school dances. No boys, Michelle. They only have one thing on their mind, to get under your skirt. For a future ballerina, that is unacceptable. Her mother admonished her. Remember, you can either be a prima ballerina or a mother. You must choose what you want, to devote your life to dance or to family. But you have me, the girl protested, yet you are a ballerina. Her mother grinned, saying, That's why I don't dance on stage, but teach others, because I have you. Of course, later they realized that Michelle would never have the leading roles. Her right leg, which had been injured in childhood by Lisa, often reminded her of that fact. And now, after a long time, Michelle appeared to have a daughter. Yes. Michelle adopted Elle, afraid to even imagine what would happen if the child were put up in a special home for kids with disabilities. She spent a long time collecting documents and consulting lawyers. When Elle was discharged from the hospital, she went to Michelle's house instead of an orphanage. Michelle's life became much more difficult. She hired a nurse for Elle, took her to rehabilitation courses, and often accompanied her to school. At the end of the day, Michelle was exhausted. However, the woman, considering that seeing her little girl try, was worth all the sleepless nights. Doctors praised Elle, sincerely amazed by her progress. They called her a real miracle. Michelle remained silent, 
but realized that it wasn't only a miracle, but also the child's willpower. The girl had more character and strength than many adults. In the summer, Elle attended a camp for active rehabilitation. When she returned, she was enthusiastic after interacting with other children facing similar challenges. It seemed like life was starting to get better. Despite this, her friends criticized Michelle. You're crazy, Michelle. How long will you be playing the role of Mother Teresa? Just send her to a boarding school, Megan exclaimed, dropping by for a cup of tea a few months later. What do you mean, send her to a boarding school? Do you think it works the same way as returning something to a store? You can't just return a child, like a carton of expired milk, Michelle retorted, getting angry with her friend for such unkind words. Megan rolled her eyes toward the ceiling and took a sip of green tea. Why don't you want a normal family? And now what? A disabled child is a lifelong responsibility. The doctor said her trauma is treatable and she's making progress. I was told she wouldn't be able to hold a spoon, and now Elle is getting on her wheelchair by herself and taking care of herself too, Michelle said with enthusiasm. Elle is a strong girl, a real fighter. She can handle it, and I'll help her. You'll see. We'll invite you to her performance. God willing, of course, but I still think what you've done was impulsive. Yes, I feel sorry for her too, but I also feel sorry for other people in trouble. But that doesn't mean I should take them all home. It's a burden, Michelle. You need to build a personal life, not ruin it. Such cruel words were not to the liking of Michelle, but she had no time for answering them. The woman did not notice how the girl in her wheelchair appeared in the doorway. You know, I already know how to do many things. The doctor praises me, the little girl said looking into the face of the adult guest with a non-childish look. Megan blushed with shame and could not find an answer. She quickly said goodbye to her friend and her foster daughter and flew out the door. After seeing her off, Elle looked at Michelle and asked bluntly, Am I a burden? Somehow my mother called me the same thing. She told Granny I was a burden. Michelle crouched down in front of the girl, taking her hands in her own. Don't listen to others, my pearl, she said, looking fondly into the child's eyes. You know, there will always be evil people around you, no matter who you are. If you can't walk, they'll act like Megan, calling you a burden. If you're the best, they'll make up gossip to smear you out of envy. The one behind you is always trying to push you from behind, to make you fall. The main thing is not to be like such people, and keep moving forward, okay? The girl licked her lips and looked at Michelle excitedly. Then she removed the plaid that concealed her legs. I have something to show you, she whispered. Michelle noticed that the girl's eyes glistened, and a tear appeared on her forehead, showing her anxiety. A convulsive exhalation escaped from Elle's lips, and then she strained all her strength, and... Oh my goodness! gasped Michelle, and at first she even thought that she imagined it, but no, Elle's foot moved and stretched at the toe, as if the girl was about to perform a choreographic movement. Elle was glowing with happiness and asked, Did you see? Michelle nodded, pressing her palm to her lips. Then she hugged the girl tightly. You're a big, smart girl. It's only been a short time, but you've made such progress. I am proud of you, my little Pearl. Of course, they didn't plan to stop at what had been accomplished. However, not everything was going smoothly. One night, when Michelle left her bedroom to get a drink of water, she heard soft music playing in her foster daughter's room, a violin. She immediately recognized the part of Odette from Swan Lake. The woman tiptoed to Elle's room, but saw only how she, trying to get into the right pose, collapsed on the floor. Michelle wanted to run up to her, hug and comfort her, but did not dare to give herself away. Meanwhile, Elle hit the floor with her fist in anger. She clenched her teeth, crying softly. Her tears in shiny beads came off her cheeks and crashed to the floor. And then the girl tried to stand up again. Michelle's heart clenched tighter 
and tighter. She was constantly looking for ways to help her daughter. That's how she found out about a great physical rehabilitation instructor, massage therapist Sean Norton. The man, if rumours are to be believed, was almost a magician who helped desperate people to walk again. Not really hoping for his help, Michelle wrote a letter. She told him about Elle's fate and the girl's hopes, not just to walk, but to make the ballet jumps she dreamed of, especially the one when the ballerina seems to freeze in midair. Some day, Michelle wrote at the end of the letter, Elle will surely become Odette, Giselle, or perform a fouette in Don Quixote, but she needs help. From the moment Michelle dropped the letter in the mailbox, a week passed, then a second passed a third. But Dr. Norton had not replied. Michelle had already lost hope when a guest arrived at her school. She didn't immediately recognise him because she had imagined Sean Norton to be an older man, similar to Gandalf from the Lord of the Rings movie they had recently watched with Elle. However, he turned out to be a blonde man in his thirties, with brown eyes and a sly squint. I've been abroad, and now I've come to see future Odette, he declared confidently from the threshold. Michelle had doubts about entrusting her daughter's health to a man who looked more like a model than a doctor. Excuse me, but aren't you too young? Michelle asked sceptically, not convinced that Sean Norton was the right person for the job. The man grinned, unaffected by Michelle's doubt. I'm sure, Michelle, that you've been told the same thing, but I also imagined a ballet teacher differently, he said, curiously looking at the woman. His remark hit home for Michelle. She had to constantly prove to people that age and a youthful appearance were not indicators of experience and knowledge. Eventually, she confided in Sean after a long conversation. Michelle agreed to the treatment, but she attended them too. Together with Sean, they developed a whole system to help Elle stand on her feet. Sean's fame was justified. He found a way to reach the child's heart affectionately. He could make her laugh easily. They worked tirelessly, day and night, and finally, the day of triumph arrived. Elle took her first steps again. They were deprived of the grace of ballerinas, but they suddenly seemed to Michelle the most beautiful steps in the world. She reached out her arms, embracing Elle. The girl tightly hugged her foster mother and whispered, overwhelmed with emotions, Thank you, Mummy. Michelle froze for a moment, unable to believe her ears. She looked up at Sean, who stood frozen beside her. He nodded, confirming that he had also heard it. Michelle held the child even tighter, kissing her on top of her head. At that moment, she was once again convinced that she had made the right choice. Elle was her daughter, and she would never let her go. In Europe, Lisa Donovan was known as Lisa White, a name she found more fitting for her new life. She changed her name as soon as she cut ties with her past. She was sure that after meeting Pierre, a streak of good luck would come her way. At first it seemed like it did. Lisa got a role, but success did not follow. Critics disliked Lisa's performance, called it empty and artificial. They claimed that Lisa had ruined a great movie. However, Pierre hurried to reassure his mistress. Honey, even bad publicity is still publicity, he argued, taking away the newspaper with another scathing article. It was your debut. The theatre is very different from the movie industry, although many people don't think so. You have to accept criticism and improve. But Lisa never learned to take advice. She was furious and had no intention of giving up especially since she had broken off her relationship with Igor through a high-profile scandal, and the path to homeland and the theatre was closed for her from now on. Yes, there were other theatre directors, but everything in this field was too interconnected. Lisa began to make her way in the world of cinema. Pierre had no idea that his beautiful and seemingly flawless Lisa was actually a wolf in sheep's clothing. She framed other actors to get roles, or simply to punish them for spreading malicious gossip about her. She acted subtly, rarely getting her hands dirty. However, people began to notice that something was not right. 
Once, during a casting for a melodrama, one of the applicants for the main role was poisoned. Some girls were suspecting the newcomer schema, claiming that she had kindly brought the victim a cup of coffee. Of course, they couldn't prove anything, but Lisa's reputation suffered, and no amount of effort could clean it, not even with such oxygen bleach as Pierre Trelliard. Lisa's career, which had never fully blossomed, began to fade. She then decided to latch on to Pierre like a snake, extracting strength, money, and connections from him. The Frenchman succumbed to her charm and became blinded by her beauty, and Lisa finally realised that her main role in life was to portray the best version of herself. As a result, she transformed into the glamorous beauty, letting go dreams of Oscars away. Sometimes she was invited to model, and occasionally Pierre granted her a role in a movie upon her pleas. He also used his connections to arrange TV show appearances for her. Lisa started doing charity work to improve her reputation. Overall, she managed to establish herself in this world, although she knew perfectly well that she was nobody without Pierre. Soon, the French director announced their engagement. Articles about their affair and future wedding appeared in numerous glossy magazines, and then Pierre and Lisa got married. It was five years after they met. Two more years later, while embracing his wife in their marital bed, Pierre asked her a question from her nightmares. Would you like to have a child, darling? Lisa's breath caught. She averted her gaze as if embarrassed, though she was simply hiding her tears from her spouse. I don't even know. I can't imagine being a mother, she muttered. Pierre touched her chin with his fingers and looked lovingly into her eyes. I'm sure you'll make a lovely, loving mother. You are made for love, Lisa. To respond to her husband's words, Lisa kissed her husband passionately, and then she purred in Pierre's ear, biting his lobe. I don't know if I want a child, but it's always nice to try. Two years had passed since that night, two years filled with attempts to conceive. However, Lisa was unable to get pregnant. Every month when she noticed her period, she would get angry and wonder, how could it be? I once conceived a child immediately after losing my virginity to some jerk, but now, no matter how hard I try, I can't conceive. Of course, Pierre also thought about the reasons and decided to accompany Lisa to the doctor, but his wife suddenly became hysterical. I don't want to, she cried out, blushing deeply. No, I hate doctors. Maybe I'll go later by myself. Pierre was surprised by her strong reaction, but he reasoned that the topic of infertility was very sensitive. He trusted his wife in everything, so he didn't argue. Little did he know how afraid Lisa was that the truth would come out. To her surprise, it turned out that Pierre valued family relationships greatly. What would he say if he found out I had already given birth, that I abandoned a disabled child? He calls me an angel, heavenly, a creature of purity and goodness. I guess this is all punishment for my sins. Payback, thought Lisa, sometimes looking in the mirror at her beautiful reflection. Another four years passed, and the subject of children became taboo in Lisa and Pierre's family. If Pierre mentioned anyone's children or his nephews, Lisa could get angry and break something. Their relationship showed cracks, but Lisa would quickly come to her senses and wrap her arms around the director's neck, apologize, and beg for forgiveness. Pierre used to give in. One day the man returned to their luxurious mansion in a great mood. He handed his wife an envelope containing theatre tickets. Swan Lake? Lisa marvelled. Yes, a famous ballet troupe is coming here. They say it's the most beautiful ballet troupe in the world. I thought you'd like it, Pierre said, hugging his wife. You mentioned taking ballet lessons as a child. Did I really say that? The woman wrinkled her nose. I don't have fond memories of it. If you don't want to go, we don't have to, said the man, and a little upset retreated to the home bar and poured himself a whiskey. Truly, it's a unique premiere. The cream of society and journalists will be there. A young prima has been invited to the Royal Ballet in London. They say she's so talented that the entire audience starts sobbing when she appears on stage. 
Hmm. Yes. Lisa, having heard that the local high society would be attending, was no longer listening about the ballerina. You know what? Let's go. But I need a new dress and shoes. I want to shine. On the day of the premiere, Lisa was sitting in one of the best seats, feeling extremely pleased and proud. Before the ballet began, she whispered to her husband, "How did you manage to get such tickets? Even that upstart from the news program, Christian, is sitting in the back." Oh, I didn't tell you. They were given to me. They came with a note saying, "Thank you for my art, especially the movie. You, Lisa, had the main role. It said that the movie helped someone to find their way in life." True, the letter was not signed. Lisa was surprised, but didn't have time to answer. The hall was plunged into darkness, and then the performance began. The audience couldn't take their eyes off the prima ballerina, who performed two roles at once. Odetta and Adelia, the performer skillfully conveyed the contrasting emotions and feelings of the heroines, and at the end, many people were moved to tears. Tears flowed down Lisa's cheeks too, but not because of the performance. She realized why she was sitting in such a good seat. She saw her face, even if it was makeup. Even after many years, the mother recognized her abandoned daughter. Who resembled her in her youth like a twin? No, it can't be. I'm imagining things. She thought, refusing to believe her own eyes. When the performance was over, the hall burst into applause. The applause was so enthusiastic that Lisa felt a knot in her stomach. She had never received such applause. What she had thought was a flurry of applause in the past turned out to be just a light breeze. Compared to the storm that had erupted in the hall, Pierre stood up and headed towards the stage. Startled, Lisa clutched at his elbow and asked, "Where are you going?" "I want to give her flowers," he replied. "She's beautiful." Lisa watched as her husband made his way to the stage and presented a bouquet of snow-white roses to the prima ballerina. The young woman smiled at him, and then she looked up and locked eyes with Lisa. The last traces of Lisa's doubt vanished, and she felt sick and suffocated. Her luxurious manteau felt constricting, and the string of pearls around her neck felt like a noose. She hastily left the hall and took a breath of fresh air, trying to regain her composure. That's where Pierre found her, with a smile on his face and shining eyes, completely unaware of his wife's pallor. You won't believe it. L invited us to dinner. She's the one who sent me the tickets. Oh, she's splendid! Maybe I can get her in the movie. Lisa listened to Pierre's words coldly. She felt genuinely frightened. What is she up to? She wondered, alarmed by the former actress's intentions. Lisa couldn't refuse dinner with the ballerina. In fact, she was more afraid to let her husband go alone than to meet her own daughter. They met at the restaurant. L was running late, and Pierre was agitated. His behavior infuriated Lisa, and she felt a pang of jealousy. When L finally appeared at the restaurant, Lisa was completely taken aback. The girl was walking towards them in an indigo-colored dress. Her dark, thick hair swept up, revealing a young and pure face. Lisa realized that her daughter had dressed the same way she had on the day of her engagement to Pierre. The difference was that Elle was incredibly beautiful and young. Lisa clenched her napkin and gritted her teeth as she looked at her daughter. Throughout the evening, she sat silent, afraid to say a word. She waited for Elle to expose her true identity to Pierre, but it never happened. Pierre remained oblivious to his wife's state. Lisa, looking inwardly at him, shuddered. Now he had that adoring look again that he had before. But now it was directed at L, and then Pierre laughed at one of L's jokes and said, "You're a miracle, dear." Lisa froze. Pierre seemed to realize his fault himself as he became embarrassed. "Gosh, forgive my frivolity, L," the director said, puzzled. "To be honest, you bear an uncanny resemblance to my wife, don't you think, Lisa?" Reluctantly, the woman looked into her daughter's face, and L stared back at her expectantly. Playing 
with her water glass. It's like your mother and daughter. Pierre suddenly made another statement. Lisa trembled as if she had been slapped. Elle, on the other hand, smiled. My mother? The girl shook her head. Alas, Pierre, I don't have one. More precisely, of course, she exists. It's just not enough to give birth to a child to be a mother. Really? marvelled Pierre. I've heard certain rumours about you, but I couldn't even guess that they had a grain of truth. Elle sighed sadly, letting her glass down on the table with a graceful movement. Alas, sometimes life takes pirouettes that you wouldn't see in a movie. The rumours don't lie. My mother, my own mother, abandoned me in the hospital when she found out I was disabled. Maybe she had her reasons? Pierre asked. There are difficult situations. There are no decent reasons to abandon a child. I thought mums always loved children, Elle said fervently, then took a breath and added more calmly, You know, I was lucky to meet good people. My teacher became a real mum to me. She showed me what a mother's love is. Love against all odds. Later I had a father. Although... He was my rehabilitation therapist first. Elle smiled broadly. It was a funny story. They constantly fought, always arguing about me, though they secretly liked each other. When I made my first decent ballet movement, they hugged for joy and Dad kissed Mum. I fell over in amazement. They were terribly embarrassed, but even more terrified. They ran up to me, but I started laughing until I was in tears. After that incident, they came to terms with their feelings. A year later, they got married. That's how Sean became a father to me. Wonderful people, Pierre said thoughtfully. However, you are an even greater miracle. Elle, to go through such hardships without a mother, without the ability to walk. Not everyone can do that. Oh, I've had good examples before my eyes, Elle decided to joke. Batman, Harry Potter, Spider-Man, for example. They lost their parents too, but nothing... They became superheroes. True, I decided not to save the world, but I still wore tight tights. Pierre laughed gleefully, not embarrassed by the audience of the elite restaurant. The Frenchman's eyes were burning. He was enraptured by the young and strong ballerina. You know, Pierre, maybe one day you'd like to make a movie about my life. I'd love to play the lead. Elle offered suddenly, and then... She smiled slyly and looked at Lisa. My mother, the one who had abandoned me, could be played by Lisa, for example. And how would the movie have ended? Lisa suddenly asked in a voice greyed with stress. Revenge? Maybe. The main thing is that the offender should know what he is being punished for. I think revenge can only be sweet when you look the abuser in the face. There was silence at the table, then Elle got up from her seat. Excuse me, I want to visit the restroom. Without a word to her husband, Lisa ran after her. Bursting into the ladies' room, she clutched at her daughter's arm with such force that the ballerina could barely keep from crying out. What do you want? exclaimed Lisa, shaking her whole body. Tell me what you want from me. Elle subdued her with a scornful look. You think I want something from you? A mother's love and care, maybe? She snorted. Although, Pierre is a wonderful man, isn't he? Do you think you and I have the same taste? Lisa recoiled, seeing the change in her daughter. She was no longer the naive beauty Odetta, but the intimidating black swan Adelia. She was frightening. Elle grinned. Say, Lisa, did you watch the performance carefully? Did you see how Adelia in the guise of a black swan, seduces the prince by pretending to be his lover. Did you see him confess his love to another? It hurts, really. I know everything about pain. Lisa licked her parched lips. Her gaze was full of fear and madness. I beg you, leave him to me. I beg of you. I will do anything, anything you ask. Just don't tell him anything. And don't take him away from me. He is my everything. The woman, who had always aspired to glamour and luxury, fell to her knees in the restroom. She grasped 
the blue hem of her daughter's dress looking down at her, Elle's face showed no emotion. "'You gave up so soon,' she said dejectedly. "'It even hurt. You didn't even fight like that for me.' Then Elle pulled back the fabric of the dress, and Lisa fell to the floor sobbing. The ballerina walked over to the mirror, fixing her makeup. "'You didn't even apologize. "'I'm sorry,' Lisa immediately cried out. "'Please, I'm sorry.' The daughter sighed. "'Calm down. I don't need him. I don't need you, either. I just want you to live and remember that you're only happy because of my grace. Because I'm better than you in every way, Lisa, even as a person. But thanks to that, my grandmother and true parents, who helped me become kinder than I would have wanted myself to be, Elle stated and walked away. Lisa stayed on the cold floor, shaking. She realised that her daughter had told the truth, and now she would live her life constantly looking back like hell. For the expectation of a blow is worse than the blow itself. Elle left the restaurant without saying goodbye. She breathed at night air, feeling relieved. Yes, sometimes she thought of revenge, of meeting her mother, but when she saw her on her knees, she did not feel triumph. She felt nothing, except a pang of disappointment. The woman, what had seemed perfect to her as a child, now only evoked pity as she cowered before her on the floor. Elle looked up into the dark sky and thought that she wanted to see her mum and dad sooner, and her little brother Alex too. She missed her real family. It's time to go home, smiled the ballerina and walked away, finally leaving her past behind her.